Hi everybody, this is Franny. And this is Heidi. And this is Heidi and Franny's Garage. And today we have something very special for you. This is our review and an owner's perspective of our 1958 Porsche 356 A Cabriolet. Now this is a very special car to us. It's been in the family for quite a while. Yes, and we do have a four part series out on our channel when we acquired this car. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please go ahead and check it out. It's really good. Yeah, so this particular uh, episode is going to be a review of the actual car. So we're gonna take you through all the kind of interesting quirks and little things about the car, the interior, the engine, all the kind of things that make these cars so unique and so much fun. So that's up next on Heidi and Franny's Garage. Now because this car is a 1958, we don't have a lot of the newer conveniences that you find in modern cars, but there are some pretty cool things that I want to show you. The majority of 356s didn't ship with any kind of seatbelt option. It, it was just an option, and so a lot of people didn't order them. And you know, they were all lap belts back then too. So. A lot of people since then have put in shoulder belts into their coupes, but in the case of a cabriolet, it's not so easy. Franny and I did put in aftermarket lap belts to make this car a bit more safe for us, but that's usually what you'll find in these cars. Another really important safety item to have in the back of your car, at least in the case of ours, we put it in the back, is a Halitron fire extinguisher and not a dry chemical extinguisher. The car has a back seat that can go up and down. When it's up, there's room for two small children or very small adults to sit here. If you want to use it for storage, you can put it down flat. And in order to keep the, car, the seat upright, if you have the top down, there are these nice little snaps that will hold it in place. And if you don't have the top down and you're just using it with the top up, there's a bungee cord back here on this side and then just at the top of the seat there's a hook here and this will hook onto that. So one of the really cool things about Porsche is that they still to this day put the ignition on the left hand side of the steering column and you'll see that in the majority of the Porsches. And how this all originated was many years ago during Le Mans racing, the driver of the car would have to start across the track and they would run over and then they would have their left hand on the ignition key right hand on the gear shift knob and that would save them a few precious seconds and now franny is going to demonstrate the lamas start for you Next, I want to 
talk about the knobs because none of the knobs are labeled on the dash. So this first one on the far left hand side above the ignition is my very favorite knob. It is just so cute. It only has one setting just on. So you pull it out and you turn on the windshield wipers. Super fun. Next to that is for the lights. Now the first setting is for the park lights. The second is to turn on the regular lights. The brights are actually on the floor and Franny will show you those later. On the right hand side of the steering column on the dash is the throttle hold. Now these cars did not have a choke back then. So if your idle was running low, you'd want to pull out on this turn it to the right to lock it and you would leave it there until your car warmed up and the idle would come up. Then once it was warm, we'd go ahead and take that off. And then the last knob on the dash is for the six volt power supply or the cigarette lighter. In the center of the dash are the ashtray, the radio and the two knobs. This is a courtesy light. It has three settings on it. And then there is this nifty little emblem here. Now what it says is in 1950 to 1957, Deutsche Sportswagen Meister Schaffner, which basically was a special award given to Porsche for being a master builder of sports cars. They got that for eight years in a row. Pretty neat, huh? So we still have the original steering wheel on the car and one of the ways you can tell it's original is because of the taupe color of paint. The taupe is three different colors. So you have the steering wheel itself, you have the steering stock and the steering column. And you can see that those are all three different colors. One of the things that I think is so sweet about this is that there's all these little nicks in the steering wheel and more than likely it was from somebody's wedding ring. I just love that. Now this car had an option to upgrade. So they have a, a steering horn ring in the middle instead of just being in the center of the steering wheel. So this is how you honk the horn is by using that horn ring. And the reason why is in the center where this emblem is, it is not the horn, it's a flash to pass. Pretty neat, huh? Behind the steering wheel, back on the dash, are the gauges. Now these gauges still have the same layout modern Porsches. The most important gauge, which is in the very center, is the tachometer or RPM gauge. On the left hand side, you have the information gauge, which tells you about the oil temperature and the gasoline. And on the right hand side, you have the speedometer, odometer, and tripodometer. I want to walk you through the information gauge in a bit more detail. So as you'll see here, we have the fuel tank level here and it, it just measures it in quarter increments. In addition to that, we have the oil temperature light above. Now remember, we do not have radiators like newer cars. So the only way you could really monitor the temperature of your car is by that oil temperature. And then I'm going to turn this on so you can see there are two lights one on the left hand side, one on the right hand side. Now you should always see these lights when you first turn your car on so that you know that the bulbs are working and those are very important lights. So the green one on the right hand side is gonna tell you if there's anything wrong with your oil pressure in your car. On the left hand side, the orange one, it should go out too because if it doesn't go out, it means there's a problem with your generator. On the right hand side of the dash is the glove box and one thing I really love about this glove box is look how cavernous it is and there's lots of room for items in the glove box and notice that it does have a lock on it so you can lock it. In addition to that there are three slots here on the door. The first one was to hold a glycerin bottle, the second one was for fuses and the last one was to hold paperwork. In addition to that on the side is a hold for the passengers to be able to hold for going around the corners. On the driver's side and passenger side door, you'll notice that there isn't a typical armrest that you might see in modern cars, but it still has the door pull that pulls the car door open and closed. In addition to that, you have a manual window crank that'll allow you to roll the window up 
and roll it down. And then you have the door release that will allow you to open and close the door. In addition to that, you can lock it. One of the things that I really like though is the built-in air conditioner with this butterfly window. You can really point the air in the direction where you want it to go. And this really does work great. When we were driving across country on our trip back from Boston, when we were picking up the car, we would use those windows like crazy. It's really, really a neat thing to, to have. So another thing I want to talk to you about is how the heat works in this car. So it's pretty basic and straightforward. There's this knob here and in order to let heat into the car, you're going to turn it counterclockwise as far as you can go to allow lots of lots of warm air into the car. And down below here, both passenger and driver have their own heat control. When you close it, you have less heat coming in. When you open it, you have more heat coming in down at your feet. Now when it's closed, the air is actually going to pass up through the dash and give you defrost. So as long as you have the heat turned on, you will get defrost by keeping this closed. On the driver's side, on the left-hand side of the steering column is the emergency brake. In order to set the emergency brake, you just pull straight back. That'll set it. In order to release the emergency brake, you're going to twist the knob to the left and then just allow it to go right back in. Directly next to that on the side is a, is a speaker. Below that is a small pocket. Now this would have been helpful for things like maps or information back in the 50s, but in this day and age, you can put a cell phone up there, your wallet, you know, whatever else you want to put up there. It's kind of handy to have. Directly above that, you'll see a knob, and this is for the flapper. When you pull out on it, it pulls the flapper in so you don't get fresh air in the car anymore. In order to lock it, You'll turn it to the left and it'll lock it into place. In order to unlock it, you'll turn it back to the right and allow it to be pushed in. There is one more knob over here, as you can see, and when I pull out on the knob, it will release the trunk. So once the bonnet's been popped, to release it, there's a latch on the left-hand side here, just to the left of the center handle. Push it all the way back and up comes the bonnet. Now, Here's the thing, there are no springs on this. So in order to get it to stay up, we push it all the way to the end, and then we slowly lower it back down. It will catch. There's a series of cams in the hinge itself there that hold the top up. Now, when you want to get it back down again, you do not pull on it. You, re you raise it back up, it will release the cams, and it'll come back down. So what I want to show you that's so important is if you're out looking to buy one of these cars, a lot of times gas station attendants didn't know that because on a Beetle, which has a similar bonnet up front, that's actually spring-loaded and you would pull on it to lower it. On a 356, like I just showed you, you have to raise it first. So a lot of 356s will have kinks and bends right here, right at the end of the hinge from somebody who's trying to walk this thing down and just pulled on it, pulled on it until they actually bent the hood very, very bad. So we lift it up, we lower it back down. We never slam it, we never let go of it. We just lower it down until it goes through the first catch. And then we, we check to make sure there isn't anything impeding it the rest of the way. You put your hand right about where the emblem is and push it down the rest of the way. And you're done. So I want to show you where the pull is for the rear deck lid. Behind the driver's seat, just nestled up here in the back seat, just against this, is the pull. So once you have pulled on the knob to release it, this works exactly the same way that the front one does, where you want to bring it all the way up until it catches on the cams. And that's something else that you might want to look for if you're looking at 356s. And then the same thing is true with putting it back down again. You want to lift it back up again until it releases. Bring it all the way down nice and gently until you can see it's just barely elevated and then just very gently push down to latch it. 
Well, that concludes my overview on the interior of the car. We're going to drive back and give you our driving impressions, and then Franny's going to give you some technical information. So what's it like to drive a 356, especially an older 356? Well, surprisingly, it's very easy to drive. It's a really fun car. It's very comfortable. It yeah. just kind of does its thing, right? I think. it's a. Now, one thing I do want to point out to you is that it is a four-speed. So uh, I want to show you a little bit about how to properly shift this car. We're going to accelerate through first gear, second gear, and third gear. First gear, we shift close to 4,000 RPM, which puts us right where we need to be for the next gear. Once again, 4,000 RPM, and look at that, right where we need to be. So the idea is that you don't want to be below the green marks here on the tachometer when you're accelerating. Now, of course, you can't help it when you're in first gear and you're starting off, but the second gear, third gear, and fourth gear should always be in this green range. And you should never try to accelerate, either go uphill or even really drive much at all with the, and I'll demonstrate here, below 2500 RPM. So you should never be in this range or lower and just driving along. You always want to accelerate up a little bit. And the reason is because the oil pump is much more efficient in these higher RPM ranges and the engine just doesn't get enough oil down there. So this is great for third gear. But if I go into fourth gear here, see how low we are? And you can hear the engine's just bogging or going uphill, it's just terrible for it. So you always want to make sure that you are, and even here we're a little low, uphill. So don't hammer the accelerator when you're not in this green range. Now we're, now we're in a good spot, we can accelerate. Now you may be wondering what these little green marks are here on the speedometer. And they really don't correlate to anything on the tachometer. They're really just to let you know that in most countries, this is the legal speed limit or range, I suppose, the legal speed range in around town driving. That's really all they're for. So you can see how I'm staying. It sounds like I'm kind of running the engine kind of fast at 3000 RPM, but that's really about where the engine wants to be most of the time. So this is actually a great range. So you probably saw our video on how we drove this car all the way back from Boston. And I kind of expected to get out of this car at gas stations and then the end of the day and go, oh my God, my back. And the, the truth is we rolled out of the car and felt great, refreshed and comfortable. And it was like a hundred degrees out some of those days. It was unbelievably warm. It was hot, but the car was still very comfortable. Right. Um, the car has a beautiful ride. It's sublime. It just soaks up the bumps beautifully. I would say this car rides better than any of the cars in the garage. There's a slight bit of wallow in the turns, you know, as you'd kind of expect from an older car, but the, these torsion bar suspensions, I just love them. They're so, they don't ring at all, like springs can ring, and they, they, uh, they're just very smooth in the way they operate. So I really like the ride on the car. The steering is great. So of course everything's mechanical, but the steering, you feel very, in touch with the road, it's very communicative, but not so much. I'd say like the 3-2 Carrera, for instance, it's constantly, it's just chatter all the time letting you know what's going on. This car, not nearly as much, but it doesn't, it gives you exactly what you need, I guess is my point. You get to hear that wonderful engine in the back, and you can kind of hear the squirrel cage blower back there. It makes a different noise than the uh, 911's uh, just axial flan fan does. The creature comforts in the car are great. There's the grab handle up front and things, and uh, the seats probably don't have quite as much bolstering, and you can move around a little bit in them. But actually, in a car like this, being super constrained is uncomfortable. So I really like that as well. Oh, visibility. Visibility is killer in this thing. It's like driving a motorcycle. You can see, look at that, isn't that crazy? You can see all the way out the back so easily. You can see out the front, you can see out the sides. Uh, 
if you need a roll up or roll down windows, you just reach over and do it. It's it's kind of small, but look at this. Look how much shoulder space we have. And yeah. look in the modern cars. It's more like this. I mean, you're almost kind of shoulder to shoulder. But look at this. It seems like it would be a teeny car, but it's actually just wonderful inside. I just absolutely love this car. And the other thing that we have now is these aftermarket headrests. And, right. you yeah. know, they are correct for what it would have been for the time. And um, if there was an absolute uh, accident or something like that, it would hopefully save our necks. But A little bit. It's, you know, they're not still guaranteed. Strong, but they're kind of nice. You can rest your heads again. So that's an important point because of the low the low back seats can right. be a little bit rough on your neck sometimes, but I actually like them. And maybe it's because I have my ponytail, but they always get stuck in the seat, but I just absolutely love them. So uh, what else? There's plenty of storage back here with, this, with the back seat down back here. There's a lot of storage and you can even put some stuff underneath the flap that we've got for the boot cover here. Um, not a lot of storage up front, to be honest, and I keep a big tool kit up there. But that's another thing. Uh, when you're driving the car, if something does go wrong with it, nine times out of ten, I can fix it with whatever's in my tool kit. And I have to call somebody for that. So in that way, the car is, is a little safer. Talking about safety. So this car has very few sort of safety bits to it. Uh, it does not have a collapsible steering wheel, for instance. There's no baffling in the gas tank up front. The car wasn't built with crumple zones. And the bumpers are mounted on little sliders, but you know, that's kind of a la Beetle. On, you know, the old Beetles were like that too. It's probably going to cause some damage and even four or five miles an hour to the car. The cars are pretty expensive to get fixed if they do get damaged. The metal work on the car can be quite expensive to get done. But yeah, we've, we've known several people that have been in car accidents and fortunately for most of the people that we've known, they haven't been in, you know, major fender benders, but they, like Franny said, significant. Yeah costs you know it can be very expensive 40 that, to 80 thousand right. dollars to but get the this stuff but the parts fixed. are available so yes. it's not the end of the world they can be found and uh you just need some te uh technically proficient really talented metal workers to be able to mm -hmm. weld in new clips and such but right. there's plenty of shops around the country that do that getting mechanicals done there's people who do your transmission do your engine it's fairly simple not I wouldn't We're say it's fortunate here in Denver we have a lot of places that can work on 356s right we have a couple of uh, dedicated shops that will actually uh, work on 356s so that's amazing actually for a car that's 60 years old to be able to find service easily that's a good point as well and it just speaks to the wide breadth of how many of these cars are out and about and still on the road today and still driving and people just love them and this is just a wonderful car i wouldn't hesitate to take this car to california and back you know oh, just, yeah right I, in fact i at, at west coast holidays people do drive their their 356s from california to new mexico like yeah. we found out when we went or you know all sorts of stuff like that so definitely it's something that you'll you will see people drive these cars yeah and there's a com camaraderie on the road. There was a little MG that just yeah, passed. You know, right. anyone with an totally older car, we're us. so excited to see each other. Right. Well, that's kind of it. I, the car is just wonderful to drive. It's not fatiguing in any way. It's easy, it's comfortable, It's it performs beautifully. I just can't say enough about this car. I think it is, in, in some ways, it's the perfect essence of what a car should be in pretty much every way, at least for me. I love this car. Now that we're back in the garage, I'd like to show you a few neat technical features of the car. The first one we're going to start with is the radio. I think the radio in this car is really fun. So it's an FM AM military band radio, which FM in 1958, oh my gosh. And then you've got your two AMs and then military band, which I think is like uh, short wave-ish, I think. And uh, it's a Blaupunk radio. And one of the coolest features in this radio 
is, well, I just have to show you. And the coolest thing about it is it's a tube radio. So you press this, the little red light comes on, and you wait for it, and you wait for it, and it has to warm up the tubes first. So there's a whole bank of tubes here, and there's a whole bank of tubes down in a box in the passenger floor footwell. And there it goes. So that's pretty neat. You have to, you have to sit there and wait for it as the tubes warm up. How old school is that? Isn't that fun? So another really cool aspect of this car is that all the pedals are hinged on the floor. So the gas pedal is hinged off the floor and so is the brake and the clutch. So that allows you to heel toe super easily. So you push in on the clutch, you can push in on the brake and see how easily your heel just goes right over on the accelerator pedal? It's so easy. I find modern cars a little more difficult because the gas pedals are, hin are swing from the top up there. But I love this, I love this configuration. It just makes it so easy and so fast to get on and off the pedals. Also in the footwell, we have a couple of round knobs down there. So the one on the bottom, this one here, is for the brights. And it's great. You can just activate it with your foot when you need it. I think that's a great place for it. And then the one above it, up here, is to give you a few squirts from your windshield washer, believe it or not. It's a little pump and it pumps water up to the windshield. And under the dash in the center is our fuel selector. So this rod turns the pet cock back there in the back and allows you to select far over to the left is reserve, down is on, and all the way up and to the right is off. So it's always a great idea to turn your fuel off when you come in just in case something goes funny with the carburetors. You don't want them filling up a cylinder with gas. Then underneath the dash on the passenger side is the fuse box. So we still have the little diagram that tells you what each fuse is for on the car. They're standard VW sort of bus fuses and you can find them pretty much at any auto parts store. You just want to keep the contacts nice and clean. Other than that, they just do their thing. I want to give you a quick overview of the engine. This is a 1600cc flat opposed four. This engine puts out 60 horsepower and 80 foot-pounds of torque. It has dual Zenith carburetors on it. It has a BR18 Bosch distributor. You can see there in the center, the orange container is the oil filter. To the left is the Bosch coil. To the right of the oil filter is a six volt Bosch generator. The little black cylinder to the right of the generator is the oil fill, so that's where we put oil in. On the left bottom of the engine down there, you'll see the mechanical fuel pump. In the far upper right, just above the right carburetor, is the voltage regulator. Something else I want to point out that's really kind of interesting, this car has carb heat. Now if you're coming down on the back side of the Alps or something and you want to be sure that your carburetors don't ice up on you, these two tubes on each side are designed to blow hot air on the carburetor. Now they're controlled by this rod over here and that rod is hooked to a bellows on the other side of the fan shroud. One interesting thing to note is that the throttle linkage that goes to each of the carburetors there is a full mechanical push rod system all the way up to the gas pedal. So there is no cable on this car at all. Another interesting thing to note is that the fuel lines are all steel fuel lines. There are no soft fuel lines until the fuel line needs to get into the tunnel and then it goes to a soft line there. But in the engine compartment, all the lines are hard steel. So something kind of cool about these cars is this is the gas tank. So it's up under the bonnet here in the front of the car. And it just has a single huge gas cap here. And you literally just open the bonnet and you pour gas in this little metal box here. That's pretty much what it is. Now, when we got the car, we had a lot of problems with leaking on our gas cap. And so what would happen would gas would come in the center here and it would flow up into the cap and come out around the edges. So I went ahead and sealed the entire outer part of this 
um, all these little crypts in here with a little bit of uh, JB Weld and it worked great. Put a new gasket on it and I haven't had a leak since. But I think that's really interesting. It's just basically a metal box that you pour gas into. There's no baffles in it. There's no anything. This right here is the, the fuel sender. And we managed to find uh, an appropriate fuel sender for the car. So originally the, the original fuel sender was gone, which was a bummer. So this one is, there are, all these parts are dated on these cars. So this one is dated 1960, which is a little late for our car, but at least it's pretty close. And we got the little white cap on the top here, which is also really kind of neat to have. Something neat I want to point out is this is the identification number for the car. It's 150204. So 150 says I'm a cabriolet and 204 is a semi-sequential number that they built the cars in. Now what's important about that is that when they talk about numbers matching cars, that's the number they're looking for, that 204. So whatever your car is, it will have its own number. And you'll find that number stamped in all the body panels on the car and all over. It's, in an, it's an identification number that's used throughout the car. So let's go on a little hunt and find a couple of them. We're back under the bonnet again looking for our identification number. It's actually right here. 204. So that tells us that the bonnet on this car is original to the car. And down here on this number plate in the upper right hand corner you'll see it 15204. And even on the boot lid back here you can see it just make out the 204 underneath the grill. In 1958 Reuter was not yet a part of Porsche proper. They were their own company across the street and so all these cars that were made by Reuter have this badge on them stating that they were made by the Reuter Custom Coachwork. Now these little guys are fun, neat little piece of, of history. They're little springs to keep the valve stem straight when the wheels are spinning at full speed. I just think these little beehive lights are just adorable. So on the T2 cars, they switched the Beehive taillights over to the teardrop taillights, but they still kept these cute little Beehives for the turn signals. And behind this grill is the horn. So there's one on each side. The Porsche scripts here are actually anodized in gold. On the front of the car, these verticals are actually aluminum and not chrome. But on the back of the car, they are chrome. The Shine Up license plate light sh tells us that we're a T2A car. The teardrop taillights say that we're a T2A car as well. Painted wheels and the Baby Moon hubcaps say this car is a normal. Had it been a super, it would have had chrome wheels. The last interesting thing I'd like to share with you is the sound of how this door shuts. It's just so solid. It doesn't rattle. It doesn't just sort of judder. It just shuts. Isn't that nice? So I heard a story that Jerry Seinfeld would go out to his speedster and he would open the door like this and just close it just to hear the sound. And it's just like no other car. Isn't that nice? Well, that's it for the technical walk around on our little 356. Well, I hope you enjoyed the owner's review of our 1958 Porsche 356A normal cabriolet. And if you did, please give the video a thumbs up. If you got any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below and we'll get right to them. We have a four part series on how we actually obtain this car. So that's great fun to watch as well. And thank you so, so much for watching. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified every time we upload another video. And in the meantime, safe travels. Bye. Woohoo! Yay! Woohoo! That was what, take seven? Mm -hmm. Take eight? Yep. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs>